We're going to move into our next panel, which is appropriately enough on entrepreneurship and innovation. It's going to be moderated by my uh, great friend and colleague, Dave Verrill, who is the executive director at the Center for Digital Business, also an angel investor in his own right and the chairman of the American uh, Angel Association these days. The Angel Capital Association of America these days. Dave, over to you. So I'm sure you've noticed that we're down a man. Uh, so I'm going to declare that uh, members of the audience are our third uh, member of the panel today. Gokul Rajaram has the flu like uh, many others in the area. Uh, this panel is about innovation and entrepreneurship. Both are alive and well in today's economy. But there are massive changes in this venture ecosystem, just like in the broader economy. Some of these disruptions have been brewing uh, since the recession hit, and others are just now showing their potential impact. And the, the goal of this panel is to take a, a broad look at the innovation economy, but uh, uh, dig more deeply into what our panelists believe are the key drivers and challenges um, of, uh, of large companies and small companies alike. So let me introduce our, our panelists. Uh, first to my right is uh, Sramana Mitra. Sramana is a founder of three companies. Uh, a long-time strategy consultant, uh, leading author, uh, ranging from Vision uh, India 2020 and, and also a widely some, uh, syndicated columnist for Forbes. Uh, in, two, uh, in 2010, Sramana founded the One Million by One Million initiative to help one million entrepreneurs globally to reach one million dollars in revenue and thus to build one trillion dollars in global GDP and along the way create 10,000 jobs. She's a master's degree from Core 6. She's from Anamitra. Thank you. 10 million jobs. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> furthest to the right is Doug Leone. Uh, you all know Sequoia Capital. It's one of the largest, most successful venture capital firms in the world. Uh, Doug's portfolio ranges from uh, Aruba, Burst, Market Live, ServiceNow, Assured, Cafe Press, Crescendo, Garden, Atezza, Rackspace, it goes on. It's a, it's a tremendous record, both for him and, him and his firm. Prior to Sequoia, uh, he held sales and sales management positions at Sun, HP, and Prime, and he holds a master's degree from the Sloan School. So let me start with uh, some uh, introductory questions. Ramana, you corrected me about the, the numbers on your one million by one million, but what convinced you that something was missing in our innovation ecosystem such that we needed to have an ambitious goal like this? So, you know, I've been in this business for a long time and one key observation I came away with um, as I was thinking about it is that uh, over 99% of businesses that go out to seek capital, investment, equity capital, venture capital, get rejected. However, we seem to be living in a strange mental state that entrepreneurship equals financing. The media has created this myth that entrepreneurship equals venture capital. So I thought that what about this other 99% entrepreneurs? Of course, this other 99% perfectly captures what I was thinking about. You know, the Occupy Wall Street was thinking about other 99% in a different context, but what about this other 99% entrepreneurs? Venture capital operates in a world where you need TAM, total available market size, of 500 million, a billion. Some, some of the VCs these days say, I don't look at a deal unless you show me a $10 billion TAM. Well, there are very, very few opportunities that fit those parameters, right? But there are numerous opportunities that could add up to 5 million, 10 million, 50 million, 100 million businesses. But a 50 million profitable business from a venture capitalist point of view is a failure. So you need to look at this economy, the, what Eric actually, when in a, one of our lunches, described as a middle-class entrepreneurship economy. We need a framework to support that economy. So yes, in our program, we are a virtual incubator, but we are a for-profit business. This is my fourth startup venture. So we are looking at it as a, uh, you know, a, a business framework to support businesses, but an inclusive incubator framework that supports that you know, middle of the pyramid opportunities as well as the venture style opportunities. It sounds to me like that's a $10 trillion 
TAM. One, uh, One. A, ten trillion a trillion dollar TAM. Dollar TAM. Um, a million by, oh, so. Over that, 10 years. Okay, now this brings us to the question of how do you define TAM? <laughs> that brings us to the question of how do we make money? Our business model is a thousand dollar annual membership fee. It's not equity. Every single incubator in the world works on an equity model. They will take equity in, the, in whatever is the top 1% of their portfolio or their deal flow and make money on the success of those deals. What we do is we are completely inclusive. Anybody who wants to join the program and learn the basics of entrepreneurship and how to put one foot before the other is welcome to do that. It's a $1,000 annual membership fee. A 1,000 times a, bil a million is a billion, Tam. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Doug, you were at the MIT Venture Capital Conference uh, late last year, and I, I saw that presentation, and you made a couple of very interesting points. One I wanted to, to, to touch on to start, and it was something to the effect that rather than use an a priori approach of searching for companies in a particular sector that you think might be uh, disruptive, you really focus more on entrepreneurs that, that bring a very unique and, uh, and curious if, uh, uh, perspective to the marketplace. That's what really turns on your interest in investing in companies. Did I state that somewhat correctly? Yeah, I think that about half of our investments uh, uh, come from market maps that we create where we think we know something and we'll look for the next incremental company on themes we work on. And half, and I would argue the most interesting half, is from somebody that comes through our doors and completely blows us away with our view of the future. When you started your company, we did not have a software backplane on our market map. The day before I met the founders of Google, I didn't have search as the next generation or yellow pages before we met the Yahoo. So the only people that can see the futures, in my opinion, is a founder. Uh, and uh, so market maps are great. Yes, we've done mobile, here's 14 mobile category infrastructure and user application, great. We, we need something here in financial services, terrific. We go look at all the companies. But the real interesting ones is when you meet the entrepreneur that completely blows you away with his, with his crystal clear, well articulated view of the future. Is there one or two examples in the last six months you could point to? Uh, there's a whole bunch of examples. When we met Tumblr, we could not have thought, oh no, now let's find a social network of people with similar interests. There's a whole bunch of them. I gave you two or three. Uh, you know, when we made the Morocco investment, we knew wireless. I was on the board of Aruba. We were with Ruckus. Oh, wireless SaaS, we get it. But then again, when we meet some of these unbelievable founders that really generate the incredible type of market caps. And I gave you the examples. Google, Yahoo, completely blow us away. They were not on any market caps. Tom Siebel, when he started his company, late market entrant. There were 32 sales management company. I can assure you we did not have a market map of starting the 32nd sales management company. And yet, if you met Tom at that point, and we did, and we try to be investors, he was crystal clear on what he wanted to do. Excellent. Uh, Shramana, I'm in Cambridge. You, the two of you are here on the West Coast, arguably two of the most concentrated areas for innovation, entrepreneurship, startup companies, growth companies. Uh, if computing and talent are geographically dispersed in this day and age, why are we still seeing concentration of startups in traditional locations, and how will uh, one million by one million overcome this sort of geographical inertia? So concentration currently, yes, we, we still have Silicon Valley, we still have uh, Boston, but we are seeing actually um, several cities coming up with large number of startups in each of those places. Um, Israel, of course, has been uh, you know, a story that has been well known. But we are seeing actually activity in a lot of different places in the world. And some of those are obvious. You know, India is obvious. There's a lot of Bangalore activity. There's a, but even in India, India is a very large geography. I come from India. I grew up in Calcutta, actually, which is a backwater city as far as technology and entrepreneurship is concerned. Calcutta is a backwater city in India. But we have several companies in the 1M1M portfolio that are 
companies from Calcutta, and that actually gives me great pleasure to tell you this story. There's a new company that just came into the program um, that wants to do 99 designs of India. How many of you know what 99design does? So very quickly, 99designs is a crowdsourced uh, design services company. So you can basically put your project up there, and, and designers from all over the world will bid for it, whether it's logo design, web design, whatever. And, and you, award design, you award the design project to whichever designer whose work you like. So this guy wants to do 99 designs in India. That fits the price points of India, and so on and so forth. The guy has no college degree. His English is terrible. But he is thinking in terms of a concept that is a globally proven concept. He's trying to do a concept arbitrage, and he's actually succeeding. This is tremendously satisfying, as far as I'm concerned. Excellent. Uh, Doug, your firm has supported the Sequoia Scouts program. Tell us a little bit about that, and, and within that context, how would you characterize the, the quality of deal flow in the last, you know, whatever period of time you like, 12 months or so? Uh, and has there been any dramatic increase um, because of incubators, uh, accelerators, business plans? I know that in the Boston area, uh, the Cambridge Innovation Center, for example, has 400 companies, startup companies, uh, in, in three or four floors, right on the edge of the MIT campus. Yeah, so prior to talking about the Scouts program, I want to lay out in 30 seconds what the market looks like. There's a whole bunch of investors, angels, that are really friends of ours and foe of ours, depending on which day of the week and which opportunity we have. And I think they play a very interesting role. And the reason they're in existence now versus 10, 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, most of the companies we build had tremendous amount of IP. It took a year to build the IP. I don't know how long. You engineer your product before you hit a customer. It probably wasn't a weekend, I'll, I'll venture to say. But right now, you can buy a PC for $1,000, be hosted on Amazon, open source, and you can build a product real quick. So I think the, the angel community plays a great role in seeds, and we do seeds. There are places like YA Combinator. There are wonderful places. We were very fortunate for the longest time to be their closest partner, and so on. And, uh, and you know, again, think of it as, as as uh, friends where, where we were able to look at the investments uh, or, or the new companies that were coming. And so we were trying to think of a creative way to get to the entrepreneurs first because at the same time we partner with the angels, if you just were to get one of these angels alone, they'd like to position Sequoia Capital or Benchmark or Andreessen Howitz as the later money. Come to us first and go to them later. And of course, we don't want to put anybody between us and the entrepreneurs. So please keep in mind that these angels are both friends. Uh, in the afternoon, foes may be from 3 to 4 o'clock, but we've got a great relationship and they play a real role. So what we decided to do is to get creative, and we instituted something called the Scouts Program, where we decided to go get uh, to go find maybe 20, 30 people who were embedded in the community to give them $100,000 to invest. And they could invest either $100,000 in one company, $10,000 in 10 companies. They had to disclose to those companies that was Sequoia Capital money. It was totally upfront. It'd be done in terms of a note. Uh, it wouldn't be around. It'd be, you know, it'd be a note that would convert us at the last round. And it was a way for us to get deeper in the market, to get people that were in a flow of things, and to see a, a whole bunch more companies. Nothing more complicated than that. And that led to a couple of investments that we made. Uh, a lot of these companies were in, are, have been invested by other venture firms. It's not that we have made all the investments, but it's been a couple of investments that we made through the angel program. And it's one of the multi-pronged approach of making sure that we get to the entrepreneur first, uh, especially the real, real special entrepreneurs, that we get there at the seed stage so we can help them or her from day one in building a terrific and more importantly, enduring company. Now, Sramana, that's kind of moving towards the crowdfunding space a little bit. Are, are you at 1M by 1M relying upon crowdfunding to support your, uh, your efforts? Uh, the short answer is no. Part of it is because crowdfunding is not legal yet, right? Crowdfunding in a donation format is legal, but you cannot really make equity investments in a crowdfunded format quite yet. That legislation has not happened. Europe you so, can, though. Maybe not in the US, but Europe has. has Europe right. does, yes. Europe does. Um, so there are a few crowdfunding com com 
companies in the uh, in Netherlands, for instance. There's right. one in London. There's there are a few. So yes, but in the U.S. it's not legal. So our actually philosophically, what we are trying to do is get people to bootstrap as much as possible with friends and family money and their own savings and most importantly customer money and and it's amazing what you can do actually if you have if you actually solve a real problem customers are willing to go a long way in supporting you in building the solution and if you can get several customers to kind of you know write some checks and and help you understand the problem you can actually bootstrap a company with customer money and there's we have great case studies of entrepreneur after, after entrepreneur who have done this successfully and then gone on to some some of them have gone on to raise venture money in fact Doug uh, we were just talking about it earlier is a company that Sequoia has funded called Agile One and this company actually pitched me recently to write about them because I also play this role of a journalist uh, sort of um, this company, he told me, he has raised 20, he has 23 million in revenue before they took funding. Doug tells me it's less than that, but less. nonetheless, <laughs> it is substantial, upwards of 10 million dollars of sure. revenue, revenue, not investment, revenue. And then they bring in Sequoia Capital after that. And can you imagine how strong a position the entrepreneur is in? If you can go walk into a meeting with Sequoia or anybody else in the valley with that, that kind of a track record, traction, customer traction, that is philosophically, that is what I'm trying to do with 1M. 1M is teach entrepreneurs that don't run after financing out of the gate. Run after customers and the rest will f fall into place if you do that piece right. Is that a philosophy that's any different from, from what you advise your, your portfolio? Clearly, if you can build a product and you can hold a lot of equity, because in my mind there is a great correlation with owners, founders, employees owning a lot with how successful that company is. They tend to be very smart, very clever, and so on. Someone that brags, I raised $45 million and I own 6%, not so smart. Uh, and uh, so that's very important. Where I would draw a line, and clearly getting customers to pay is key, because it shows you built something that somebody cares about, so that's terrific. Where I draw a line is where you uh, think of a company as a very fragile thing, and think of a young founder especially, sometimes not so young, but think of a founder as a very lonely person. And one of the reasons we have been successful for 40 years is the real sensitivities to what you plug into these companies. Stay away from the stupid lines that you hear in the venture business, the next level, the guy who's done it before, the project, and doing that very carefully. And oftentimes, when you over-angel yourself, you've got money, but you don't have the knowledge on how to recruit the up-and-coming sales guy who was a regional manager who managed 22 people, why that's a better candidate than the person who's managed 2,000 people who's really an administrator is on his way down. So yes, customers matter. Yes, Angel has a role, absolutely. But I would draw a line in these companies that I consider to be over Angel, that by the time they need real help, you look at the cap table and 42% is gone. And you say, oh, now the guy needs help, poor guy. And you know, you almost don't want to be an investor because now you want to buy 25%, management owns 30, and you haven't done anything yet. So customers matter, roll for angels, but make sure those of you that want to start a company that you figure out the right time, and I don't want to be too preachy on when you really want to bring someone that's with you for the long term, someone that's with you on the way down, because all startups don't go like this. As a matter of fact, 95% of them go like this. And there are some dark times where you may need some help in some deeper pockets. The only uh, addition to that, to that comment I would make is that if you actually do the customer piece right, you don't need a lot of angel money. The customer money, quote unquote revenue, that equates to valuation increase, not dilution, is actually the best kind of money that you can bring into your company. Doug, I was looking at, at the Sequoia website last week. I think there might have been an, an, an update, and one of the list of characteristics of entrepreneurs was up there, and it, it went something like creative spirits, resolute, determined, indefatigable, but also underdogs, defiant, 
quirky outsiders? Look, I, I, I think great people usually are outliers. They're, they don't walk down Main Street. They're not the quarterback of the football team that had a terrific life. They're, pure, they're probably the kid in high school who was made a little fun of, who, whose engine runs a little hot. They're the person with an IQ 15 points higher that maybe didn't relate, didn't go to the right parties. They're misfits, and I mean that as a compliment, not as a knock. They are unconventional, they're stubborn, they're not great listener, terrific, that's what you want. Steve Jobs, not the greatest listener. Larry Ellison, Vivek, I bet you, you weren't the greatest listener either. <laughs> Completely driven, committed, and those adjectives, the shallow venture guys launch are these terrific human beings, are exactly the qualities you look for in people that are gonna change the world. I like that. Uh, I think many of the people in this crowd resemble that remark to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, clearly, Vivek, clearly, a lot of basketball. <laughs> Vivek, I noticed the person behind you was going like this when Doug made that comment about you. <laughs> So uh, one of the questions uh, earlier from the group was something to the effect that um, uh, in this economy, innovation has slowed. Shramana, do you have an opinion on the pace of innovation? You know, at the moment, I'm actually worrying a lot more about entrepreneurship than innovation, and they're not necessarily synonymous terms, mm -hmm. right? So we have lots of examples of concept arbitrage, or you know, concepts that don't seem to, at least from Silicon Valley point of view, doesn't seem like the most innovative concept in the world. We have an entrepreneur in Greece that is doing a software as a service product for car rental companies in Greece, which he hopes to you know, bring to a larger world. This is not exactly innovation the way we think about it, not the kind of innovation that Vivek is thinking about. But if you think about where Greece is right now, it's incredibly important. If you get more guys like those to create value, to create entrepreneurial ventures, to make money, that is the solution for Greece. So I don't really care too much whether this guy is building the next self-driving car. I care a lot about making sure that this guy is able to bring a sustainable, profitable company at whatever scale he is capable of building it at. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of the discussion today has been about the growth of technology, but this paradox in that uh, a, a, the bulk of the average American worker is not benefiting from, a lot from that technology. When you see a company like uh, Facebook uh, buy uh, uh, Instagram for a billion dollars with a couple of dozen employees, does that say anything to you? Doug, I know you were an investor in, in, in uh, Instagram. Do you even think about employment in, in the companies that you support? Um, I don't know if that's a question on innovation or dumb luck. We were Instagram for two days. We were investors for 48 hours. Uh, it was an active ownership. It wasn't all those things. We didn't do a single thing. I want to make that crystal clear. Understood. Uh, look, I think the rate of change is only increasing. And there was the silliest article in The Economist with a guy in the toilet saying, all great innovations are, you know, why don't we innovate things like that? Well, I'd put an iPhone right next to a toilet and, and I wonder which one is more valuable. Uh, uh, I actually think where, you know, if you believe in Moore's Law, uh, six years from now, there's gonna be 4x time to compute power. And as I mentioned on some MIT event that I attended uh, 30 days ago, I think we're entering the line, the part of the curve, uh, and it's not a linear curve, uh, where it's gonna be quite visible. I think things are only accelerating. I think every new great company grows way faster than the one before. We thought we'd seen it all with, with, with Cisco, then Yahoo blew our mind, then Google was even faster. I think things are only going faster and faster and faster, and I think the next 10 years are gonna be incredibly exciting for innovation. Mm -hmm. And Tramana, uh, Tim O'Reilly talked a bit about the sharing economy earlier, um, and I'm wondering if uh, you're focused on any type of sector 
uh, in incubating companies or if you're seeing the sharing economy as being a, a big part. And, and I'm gonna sort of get into the cost of starting and, and funding a company in a second, but, but let's start there. So uh, we focus on IT and IT-enabled services right now, and, and our uh, model is a lean capital efficient startup building model. So if you need $10 million out of the gate, we will not be able to work with you. So if you're trying to do a chip, we're probably not the right solution for you. The share, on the sharing economy, we have a number of companies in the portfolio that are working on sharing related stuff. Rentamaternity.com, maternity clothes are useless. How many times are you gonna be pregnant? How, and, and, and any one period of the pregnancy, you can only wear clothes, the, the same clothes for three months and then you have to get different clothes. This woman in Colorado is doing a company that is basically sending back the maternity clothing and somebody else kind of rents it or subscribes to a, mm -hmm. a set of clothing, but good clothing because you still have to go to work and look professional and so on and so forth. So we have various flavors of car sh uh, pooling, right. Um, right. all sorts of things. So that this, this, is, a, this is a trend. trend. There's lots of companies that are being built out of that trend right well, now. One of the reasons for that is that it's relatively cheap to share your excess capacity. Yeah. And I think many would argue that it's relatively inexpensive to start a certain class of company, certainly not the hardware or manufacturing oriented company. Um, you know, Doug, you've got a large fund. Uh, you've got to deploy a significant amount of capital. Do you see any difference in today's um, application layer like companies in terms of the amount of capital they really need to grow? So I, I guess in the first place, we, we do not have a large fund. Sorry to correct you. We have a small fund, Four, $400 million, 30 companies. It's not billions of dollars. Uh, if anybody ever used words, put money to work at Sequoia, I, you know, I might shoot them. Uh, or pressure to invest, there's none of that. Uh, it's only, there. think of it as infrastructure and consumer. Infrastructure companies take a lot to build uh, and take a lot to roll out and take a lot to start. Consumer companies where, you, where you, again, you have the, this PC uh, and you can do a prototype in a weekend are way less expensive to start, but I would again argue, be careful with the cost to start versus cost to build. The cost to build is the real important part. And uh, the, the trick there is raise as little money as possible, keep as much of the company as possible as the founder, build a little something, go raise money at a high price. But if we look at the consumer companies, the great ones, they're not cheap to build. They take 10, 20 million dollars. You know, because you've got competitors, you've got other kids that want to start companies, and you have no choice but to run like a son of a gun, and that's expensive. If you're building a complicated chip, chances are there's not another 14 players. But try doing a consumer company that catches a little bit of fire, you have a 90-day head start, which is precisely why lookalike companies in other geos don't work, because here you've got 90 days at start. In China, if you want to copy Groupon, just 70 of them a day later. And so, and so consumer companies, they're cheaper to start, but you've got to run really, really fast. And th which means two things, that you've got to get the pixels right, I meaning you have to have a terrific product that consumers like, and you have to run even by spending marketing dollars to run as fast as possible and go hiring great engineers to often build a network without revenue. Later it can be monetized, but if you build a large network with no revenues, that takes money. So cost to start versus cost to build. Tramana, does your um, platform have uh, the vision of helping companies to raise capital or simply yeah. to advise them? No, we do raise, uh, help them raise capital as well. Just a, uh, you know, one point there to keep in mind is that not every entrepreneur is built to scale. You know, not every entrepreneur has the capacity to scale to building billion dollar companies or to building venture style companies. So I have a great case study of this woman in Florida who, is, who has built about a $12 million a year profitable company. It's a niche e-commerce company selling cable organizers. So you have all these cables sticking out from everywhere. <laughs> they provide concealers and, and you know, basically all the stuff that can make it all look nice and clean. $12 million a year is not small money, right? For a, small business with 
you know, 50, 60 employees, most of their employees are in the warehouse because this is not a technologically, it's not a complex thing to build. It's a niche e-commerce. Your e-commerce platforms are off the shelf these days. You load up your uh, inventory and you can start selling. But the way to build these companies is really do very good search engine optimization and Google just sends traffic to you. If you have a really well-positioned niche e-commerce company, Google just sends traffic to you. Even organic traffic, you don't even have to pay PPC money. And that converts into dollars. So, so there, is, you know, there are lots of ways of being successful as an entrepreneur. That's the, the point, the counterpoint to Doug's point that I'm trying to bring here is that don't think success is only the venture style success, which is what we've been told to believe. The, the, the journey that we as entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have traveled is that lifestyle business, quote unquote, is bad. The only kind of business to go after is the venture style business. Maybe you are not cut out to be a venture style company. Maybe your comfort zone is more in building a $10 million, $20 million company, and that's okay. I, I think, a, a, first of all, I, I think that an economy is driven by small businesses. So mm -hmm. I compliment you and I thank you. And you're absolutely right, that in every business can be a great business. But I wouldn't call them venture versus small. I'd call them small businesses that employ a larger number of the population in the US, nothing wrong with them, versus large and enduring businesses. We, in our partnership, are interested in the latter. It isn't to say the former is wrong, but we're interested only in the latter. We want to build large and enduring businesses and we're, very, and we're very happy to say, and I'll apologize for the brag a little bit, so please forgive me, but we've been fortunate enough that the companies in which we have been fortunate enough to be associated with are responsible for 20% of the total value of the NASDAQ. We like to go to back terrific founders, help them build it in markets that don't exist, in markets that can be new and creative, where they can be the leading company, and they can have 10, 20 year runs. That's the business we're in. Nothing wrong with being in the other businesses, being a sole proprietor, having 10 million in revenues, employ 20, 30 people, that's 20, 30 families <laughs> that get fed, that's wonderful, just not the business that we're right. in. Well, and, and these guys, the, the, the other end of the spectrum, don't even show up in, on the radar of NASDAQ valuation because they don't trade in any kind of exchange. They are off the radar of the capital markets. But there's a very nice uh, entire ecosystem here you know, last year, angels and VCs uh, funded something on the order of $50 billion worth of companies, whether or not they were the high growth companies or the, the bar or restaurant down the street. Uh, we're all job creators, and I think that's a critically important role for, for any investor in, in this ecosystem to play. So we've got a little bit um, less than 10 minutes to, to play here, so let's get a couple of questions from the audience, if anybody has one, please. Over here. There's a, there's a microphone there. We're going to follow the same rules as before. Brevity okay. is impressive. Great. Question for Sermana as a Core 6 grad with a lot of entrepreneurial experience. Great deal of entrepreneurial interest among the students at MIT. And this is aimed at not the business and Sloan students, but rather Core 6 students. What's the thing that MIT needs to do for these students to help them on their way to be entrepreneurs? What's, what's been missing? Do you want an honest answer? Uh, this time, please. <laughs> you know, I'd be delighted to roll out 1M, 1M in that program, because I came through course six and I was pre-internet. We are the generation that kind of came, grew up as entrepreneurs with the internet. There was nothing to learn the template from of how to put one foot before the other. If you arm, you know, large numbers of highly engineering trained entrepreneurs or engineering trained people in these basic templates of entrepreneurship of just understanding the framework of how to put one foot before the other, I think as a society, as a world, as a global economy, we would do tremendously better. And that is the vision of 1M, 1M. So to add a little bit to that, if I may, uh, the Deshpande Center has no distinction between what course you, you come from at, at MIT in order to take advantage of uh, of that benefit. It's a tremendous program uh, at MIT that uh, 
provides proof of concept funding for any member of the faculty, the staff, or the student body. Uh, secondly, the MIT Venture Mentoring Service is also a similarly fantastic opportunity for anybody within the MIT ecosystem to get mentorship. Uh, any other questions? Down in front here, I think, Justin. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Angela Liu. And uh, first of all, I have to confess that uh, I'm actually in the finance field, so I am crashing your grand party today. Uh, my question is that, uh, um, like a lot of my peers in the industry, uh, including myself, we were once uh, quantitative and uh, you know, science boys and science girls who wanted to become an engineer or work for a technology company. Uh, but because uh, the investment bankers you know, and other uh, industries, they are very aggressive and proactive and uh, visible, uh, at a college recruiting and even business school recruiting sessions, uh, a lot of us actually were lured into the investment banking industry or some other you know, similar industries. So I wonder, uh, I often hear about uh, technology companies uh, talking about competing for talents with each other. So I wonder what uh, uh, the industry uh, you think can do and should do, uh, especially at a college and at a business schools to compete for talents with other industries, not just uh, against each other. Thank you. You take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. Okay. <laughs> so um, I, I wrote a column for Forbes uh, right at the height of the financial crisis. Um, it was called Capitalism's Fundamental Flaw. Um, it was on the cover of Forbes, on the homepage of Forbes.com for a month, and it got tremendous discussion. And the thesis of that article was the speculator versus value creator debate. And my observation, you know, I grew up in India, as I said, I told you earlier, I grew up in Calcutta, which was a communist state in, in India, and I hated the whole concept of you know, communism. And I read Ayn Rand when I was 16 years old, and given that setup, it was a very deeply influencing book. And I embraced capitalism as a, as a philosophy. And I thought, you know, a lot of the principles of Ayn Rand were all kind of good, until this financial crisis is when I started questioning capitalism. And part of the reason I started questioning capitalism was, to some extent, what you're pointing out here is the, this thing that capitalism has been hijacked by speculators. And this is a very long discussion. I really don't want to get into it in, in any depth because this is a session in itself and I've given talks about capitalism 2.0 and the you know, crisis of capitalism, the speculation, speculator versus value creator debate, but think about it. If you were interested, go read my article and I have actually a whole body of writings on this topic. So my answer is a little harsher, which is why I, it reminds me of when you see commercials, have you been taken advantage by a speculative loan? As if the person that got the loan assumes no responsibility for their action, which is unfortunately is the mentality that we're all heading towards, which I am completely against. I think it's up to all of you, it's up to us to educate the youth, there's many avenues, but it's up to the youth to figure out whether they want the heroin drip of $122,000 out of college or go build something and go do something else. I think people have to take personal responsibility given an education that, the, that a university can do and think about it. If there's ever been a, a technology school, it's MIT and yet a lot of people went into banking. So it wasn't that MIT said get an engineering degree and go to banking. I think it's re the responsibility of the individual to figure out how to run his or her life. And I think with engineering, we should teach philosophy. Anybody else have a question? Justin, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question for Sramana. Um, so uh, how close are you to a million members uh, in your uh, group? I am not even remotely close. And what's Our entire community touches 50,000 people. So I, I, I mean, this is my life's work. It's going to take me 30 years to, to achieve what I'm 
set, I've set out to achieve. It's a very, very ambitious project. And, and what services do you provide to the members? What services we provide? Oh, okay, so we have um, a curriculum that we have developed over the last six years. And this actually, the effort began way before I started One Million by One Million. I started noodling with all this through my writings mostly. We started inviting entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs who've built sizable businesses to come and tell their stories on my blog. And through that process, we have today over 600 entrepreneurs who have come and shared their journeys and their success strategies, and I've really granularly probed into how they've put one foot before the other on multiple dimensions of business building. So it's an entrepreneur to entrepreneur conversation, and we have developed a tremendously valuable, inspiring, and educative body of case studies. The other thing we've done since 2008 are online mentoring sessions over WebEx. And these have been, we're on our 158th session this week. And over 15,000 people have participated in these. What we've been able to get through those sessions, these, these run like reality shows. Any of you can join. It normally happens on Thursday mornings. What we've been able to do through that process is coach entrepreneurs and understand what are the issues of their lives. And we've triangulated these two, and we've created this video lectures and case study based curriculum, which is kind of a scalable mentoring program in itself that is able to today tackle over 97% of the questions that we get. On top of that, so that's behind the subscription fee. We have the free mentoring session that happens once a week, but behind the uh, paywall, we have the curriculum and we have private mentoring sessions, which are the same format as the public sessions, but they're private and you know, uh, members only. Then we do all the Rolodex opening that most good incubators do, introducing to customers, channel partners, investors, media. I have a lot of cloud in the media. We put that cloud to work for, on behalf of our entrepreneurs and uh, analysts, whatever. Um, so that's you know, roughly this, this is as far as we've got so far. And there is a product roadmap behind this. And as we you know, garner more resources and become more successful and, and maybe mo raise money, I don't know yet. But I, so far, I've turned down venture capital. And, and that was a conscious choice because I don't fully have the logic of this business figured out. And this gets back to what Doug was telling you earlier, is that you want to build something and you want to do your experimentation and figure out exactly how you're going to bring this product to market and so forth. Experimentation on venture capital dime is very expensive. However, the minute I figure out if I put in $7 million into the company, this is what I'm going to do, and the company is going to scale rapidly, I'm OK with taking money. I'm not there yet. We have customers, so we have validated that customers want this. We actually have B2B customers as well. We have corporations who are sponsoring chunks of 1M1M one &one scholarships right now including geography, your question about geography. We've had companies uh, wanting to do specific geographies with us. So, so there, are, you know, there are a lot of pieces that I have in place, but I have been doing this for two years, and we are still a very small early stage startup. Well, maybe today um, the, the people in the crowd will be part of your community and, and support it. And, and, and Doug, perhaps we can keep bringing you our defiant, quirky outsiders. I'd like to thank you both for for joining the panel today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.